All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's really nice to have you all joining us this evening. My name is Claire Doran. I'm really excited to be here tonight. So since 2020, we've all been living and working in ways that were unimaginable before. And new initiatives providing solutions to unexpected challenges are springing up all over as we try to adapt to a complex and rapidly changing environment. The Hastings Emerging Futures Project is a collaboration between organizations across Hastings funded by the National Lottery Community Fund. And we're creating space for community conversations to share new ideas, tools, and techniques, and explore how our plans to build back better can align with the needs of people and the planet. To do this, we need to shift our thinking from focusing on growth and its unsustainability to what it could mean to thrive within the boundaries of what our planet can sustain, drawing from Kate Rayworth's Donut Economics Framework. All over the world, towns and cities are doing the same thing that we are, trying to understand how to live more sustainably and plan for a complex and uncertain future. So how can this help us to shape our local plan? In tonight's community conversation, we're going to be joining millions of people starting these kinds of conversations and asking our amazing lineup of local guests a big question. How can our town be a home to thriving people in a thriving place while respecting the well being of all people and the health of the whole planet? We are absolutely thrilled to be putting on a very quick paced, exciting, and ex inspiring night ahead for you. Uh, the purpose is, of which is basically to start a conversation with each other. We want to know what you, our friends and neighbors, think we need in order to thrive here in Hastings. Um, and we'll be wrapping up with some spotlights on our own community's solution. So sit back, listen deeply, and we look forward to you joining us to enrich and deepen the conversation about sustainability here in Hastings. As a bit of housekeeping uh, and to help us make the evening as participatory as possible, we're going to invite you to share your questions and comments in the chat box. To help our moderator sift through the chat box more efficiently, please start your comment with one of the following. Question if you are submitting a question, comment if you're making a general comment, and resource if you are recommending a book, film, podcast, et cetera, or you just wanna highlight an organization that is doing great work. So without further ado, we'd love to introduce you to our amazing panelists this evening. Starting with Gonzalo Alvarez. Gonzalo is a marine biologist and passionate campaigner for the environment and biodiversity, particularly life underwater. Gonzalo has been involved in research teams on climate change for projects funded by the UNDP, led international teams in Latin America and the Caribbean in coastal communities, and participated in several international forums on human development. This global experience led Gonzalo to reflect and campaign on global issues, such as the climate biodiversity crisis, um, but he's seeking principles for making positive differences in our local communities. Gonzalo is the founder and chair of the United Nations Association Climate and Oceans. Uh, Dr. Raleigh Hitava is our next speaker um, and is a research fellow at the Science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex. For the past 10 years, Raleigh has been researching energy transitions and infrastructure governance, which she believes is one of the most important ways that our daily lives are shaped. Um, from how we travel to what kind of futures we can imagine. Raleigh is interested in engaging others in thinking about infrastructure and making de decisions about what kinds of infrastructure we want and what we hope it does for us. So welcome Raleigh. Uh, we have next Julia Hilton. Julia is an artist and landscape architect who is inspired at the very heart of her work by plants and the natural world. Julia believes that everyone, wherever they live, has the right to experience inspirational and beautifully designed green public space on their doorstep. Her work is often about making connections between differing visions and values and using design skills to enable people to make positive changes in their local environment. She has recently been part of the team bringing a vision of Hastings as a garden town to life. Um, next, we have Hannah Robbins. 
Hannah is the owner of Wonderfill, a refill shop in St. Leonard's that sells food, toiletries, cleaning products, and other household essentials. Um, before opening up the shop, she spent 13 years working in marketing, a career that gave intimate insight into the role of multinational corporations and linear economics in the plastic crisis, as well as other contemporary issues. Uh, we're also joined by Anna Locke. Anna is a gardener and uh, community gardener, permaculture designer, facilitator, and small farmer living in Hastings. She loves growing and preserving food and is the author of The Forager's Garden, Grow an Edible Sanctuary in Your Own Backyard, um, and teaches instant permaculture gardening courses. Uh, we are also joined this evening by Raquel Duran, who will be creating a live capture illustration of this evening's discussion. So I just want to go and say hello, Raquel. How are you doing this evening? Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here to join you all. And I'll be drawing at the same time that everything is going on. And uh, at the end, it's going to be like an artwork that we can all share. And uh, so hopefully it's going to uh, help remember what's happening today. So looking forward to it. Amazing. Thank you so much, Raquel. Um, so it's going to be a fast paced, very inspiring, quick evening. So um, hope you can kind of keep up with us. Uh, we will certainly not uh, be bored as we kind of go through all of these amazing um, visions of kind of a big sustainable picture for Hastings. So to kick us off, um, we are joined by Izzy Withers, who is a bright new talent who graciously accepted our invitation to perform for us all tonight. Izzy will perform her rendition of Imagine, the John Lennon classic, as a fitting theme setter for our evening. So thank you so much, Izzy, and over to you to set the tone for the evening. I just want to say thank you so much for this opportunity and what all of you are doing is really amazing and I hope you enjoy. Imagine there's no heaven It's easy if you try No hell below us Above us only sky Imagine all the people living for today. Ah, imagine there's no country. It isn't hard to do. Thing to kill or die for and no religion to imagine all the people living life in peace you you may say I'm a dreamer but I'm not the only one I hope someday you will join us And the world will be as one Imagine no possessions I wonder if you can no need for greed or hunger the brotherhood of man imagine all the people living life in peace you they say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope 
hope someday you will join us and the world will be as one and the world will be as one thank you so much Izzy for for that incredible rendition I yeah letting that settle in um so Gonzalo um I know that's a tough act to follow but we'd love to come to you first uh to kick us off for the evening so would you mind um kicking us off for the evening yes indeed good evening everyone Hastings and St Leonard's are Sussex coastal towns. Inevitably, all their residents are connected to the ocean. During this time of COVID-19 lockdown, the Hastings and St. Leonard's seafront has been a major focal point for exercising outdoors for the residents. They have been out there by the sea with their families, their children, their pets, breathing the fresh sea air, enjoying the beauty of the mighty ocean. Of course, the ocean gives us 50% of the oxygen available on the planet by capturing CO2 from the atmosphere. And the ocean also absorbs huge quantities of heat from the atmosphere, preventing the planet from overheating. But now the ocean is struggling to do so because of climate change. Here in Sussex, the underwater biodiversity is amazing. We have seals, dolphins, seahorses, crabs, kelp forests, cuttlefish. Imagine all that beautiful biodiversity. Imagine, we just heard, imagine. And they pay, and these, Lovely creatures underwater, they play a key roles in their ecosystems in Sussex, including here in Hastings and St. Leonard's. But we have a planetary biodiversity crisis and Hastings and uh, St. Leonard's um, cannot avoid this. Our waters are not the exception. Hastings cannot be sustainable without keeping a healthy seashore, for example. Now, in the case of those people who have ventured closer enough, getting in touch with the seawater, like you and me, they experience the energy of the ocean. The, uh, that energy is kinetic energy, and it comes in orbitals of energy, as they are known in oceanography. Those orbitals of energy gives us the waves in Hastings. The stronger the orbital, the bigger the wave. And so when that energy of the ocean touches your body as waves, it helps your blood circulation. And the sea salts penetrate your skin and revitalizes your skin. It's the magical healing power of the ocean. And I'm ready for some questions. Thank you, Gonzalo. That was lyrical in its very own way. Um, and you can very, very clearly hear the kind of the poetry and the science, the science and the art in that. So thank you. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Quiva, who's been keeping an eye on the chat for us to bring forward any questions or comments from the audience that we've gotten so far. Quiva, can I come over to you? Thank you, Claire. And thank you, Gonzalo. That was really beautiful. Um, thank you. So we've had comments and questions from the audience. Jill White asks, Gonzalo, please can we make a big rock pool or several using some of the low tide rocks? Sign me up as a volunteer. And Jill also says, desperate for more trees all over the town, including St. Leonard's. 
We've also had the question from Ken Davis, a really good question. Is there going to be a document of conclusions or proposals coming out of this exercise? And Ken, we're definitely keen to share loads of resources after this event, which we will share with you. Um, but also, we'd love to hear from you about what you are doing, because we know there's loads happening in Hastings already. And Amanda Jobson asks, with the government's announcement plan for a green industrial revolution, will local council rethink ideas on housing and incorporate cultural community gardens on a big scale for sustainability? Nick Sangster asks, I wonder if it would be helpful to think about regenerative actions and activities rather than sustainable. The words are really important and set the tone and sometimes our intentions. Julia Hilton asks, the ocean is magical, but also a threat. With rising sea levels, how can we accommodate that into our town? And perhaps Gonzalo will have something to say on some of those. Thank you so much. Um, yes, I mean, there's a lot there, obviously, but uh, in terms of the um, rising sea levels, um, it, it is true that um, because of global um, warming, we have a problem there, but we need to understand that the rising sea levels is not coming from the oceans. The, um, it, it's actually coming from the melting of the ice caps on, on the Ar Arctic and Antarctic. So it's ice that is actually on land, shall we put it that way, also from certain parts of Siberia and then on the Northern Hemisphere, Antarctica. So, so, so it's, it's not directly, it's not because of, of ice melting in the, in, in the oceans. So that's one thing to, for us to keep in mind. Uh, it's because of that imbalance that the 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 planet is trying to rebalance this uh, this overheat that that is happening because of of global warming and and excess um, um, you know gases in the atmosphere that unfortunately as we know it's 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 happening more and more so that's the first thing to keep in mind but uh, but thinking more locally that per, that per person mentioned about some of the rock pools i think see leonard's has and, and hastings have enormous potential and the first thing is to imagine as we started this evening so hastings in my view needs to recover its maritime heritage it used to be you know one of the sunk ports to sink ports you know very important in the in the medieval times, it has the the largest uh, fleet, you know, fishing fleet in the, in the country. It has an amazing pier. It has amazing sea views that have been absolutely essential for for lockdown for people enjoying the vastness of the mighty ocean. So we need to reconnect with the oceans here in Hastings and St. Leonard's, in my view. We've got the aquarium, we've got the shipwreck museum, so much potential, beautiful seafood, fresh seafood that we should be, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm so, so often um, frustrated when, you know, that odd uh, negative review on newspapers and we should counter that, say all the fantastic potential that we have here in, in, in Hastings and St. Leonard in connection to the, to the oceans. It's part of our heritage, it's part of history. This kayaking, we know that in the in the summer, it's beautiful. I, I do it myself, you know, by the pier and everything. It's absolutely wonderful exercise. Um, the, the, we should have more maritime related activities. It's 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 that natural thing for us. We've got the rowing the rowing club, for example, in Hastings. We've got the sailing club in Salerno. It's huge potential. I, I would imagine, for example, uh, see, sailing. It's zero carbon, zero carbon. You know, and imagine if we could all organize a huge regatta in, in the case of Selenet, as we do with a motorist in the, once a year in Hastings, why do we organize a huge regatta and, and all of us in thousands go and watch that regatta as they do in Southampton, for example, that will attract economy, will, you know, will generate jobs. It would be amazing, absolutely amazing and zero carbon, you know. Eastbourne has the air, airborne, where we know where, what happened with the with with the air, aeroplanes and and and, and fossil fuels. But if we could create a movement with, with a, you know in the sailing regatta, huge regatta, thousands of people there, we gather the, the masses there. It would be amazing. It's natural for Hastings, isn't it? Isn't, you know, um, other things I would love to see. You know, um, that we 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 could. The, the seafood and, 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 and wine festival, one of my highlights for in the year. 
why do we promote that internationally, for example? You know, bring people from all over the world and that could be, again, reconnecting Hastings naturally to the oceans because we have them here. You see, I, I, I love these little creatures here. And look at that, the beauty of the natural world. And what you see here, what you see here with this, this shell is CO2 captured by nature. That is what you see here. It's, it's, it's CO2 that it's been captured through the oceans by this, by this creature mixed with carbon carbonate. And that is a physical example of what the ocean does for us. It cleans the atmosphere. And this is a physical view of, of that carbon carbonate. It's, Thank you. Here is carbon. Um, so anyway, much. full of ideas, you know, full of ideas. Yeah, and I, what I'm hearing from you is uh, the sense that the, the natural world is doing work to rebalance our relationships. And yeah. it's part of our work in the relationship to reimagine how we can also support to rebalance that. So thank you for already some incredible and inspiring ideas. Um, we're going to go to our next panelist to go even further into some of these imaginations. Um, so I'd like to invite Raleigh um, to speak a little bit about your response to the big question. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Valetza Hitova, and I'm a resident of St. Leonard's. I'm also a research fellow at the Science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex. So for the past 12 years, I have been working on infrastructure. I'm boring, I know. But it's about how do we as a society make decisions about what kind of transport, buildings, pipelines, and cables we want to invest in? And how do we make these investments work for the things we want? ideally less environmental impact from what we build and what we use. We are in the midst of unprecedented investment in infrastructure. Uh, it's many times more powerful than, than what the Victorians did. As we're building new transport links, we're building new generation capacities and upgrading existing infrastructure to make it more responsive, more efficient and lower carbon. We are also in the midst of unprecedented changes in the way in which infrastructure is managed and delivered. So increasingly we're seeing the digital networks, digital technology and automation are becoming part and parcel of interacting with different types of infrastructure. And you see it in your everyday life from car parks to energy supply and who controls your smart meter. So investments we make today about where our energy comes from and what materials we use to dictate how we live, how we benefit from the infrastructure we invest in, and what choices for change we have long into the future. Many of us don't realize that a lot of the infrastructure which is currently being built and upgraded is generously supported and underwritten by public money and uh, in many cases also by future consumers. For example, by guaranteed routes and numbers of users for services. However, the one thing that hasn't changed is how decisions about these investments are being made and how little opportunity for real engagement there is for infrastructure investment and decision-making for the public. And this really needs to change. By engagement, I don't mean informing people about the right type of infrastructure, which is being developed locally, or the right type of infrastructure for the country, we call it infrastructure of national importance, and not talking about involving people in the planning process to accept this right infrastructure choice. What I'm talking about is making local communities an equal stakeholder in making multiple decisions about what type of infrastructure we need, what benefits and value we want from it and how people can access it. And these choices and opportunities to participate in uh, these decisions uh, should be throughout the whole uh, lifespan of a project, from when an idea is conceived to how we're disposed of infrastructure we no longer need. So what we have seen recently is that the UK government, like many other governments, has announced powerful infrastructure investment packages from the UK industrial strategy, which was introduced in 2016, which selects winning industries to uh, more recent local green stimulus packages and a 10 point plan. So what these outline is a significant investment in the built environment 
in the roads, train tracks, the pipelines, the cables, which will underpin the economic growth and prosperity that we want as a society. However, even when they focus on investing in green sectors and technologies, like solar power trains, electric vehicles and heat pumps, they are quite often only investing in part of the solution. So technology or any kind of infrastructure on its own does not automatically create value for customers and local communities and most definitely does not retain it in a specific place. What we do want is we want a type of infrastructure that not only creates value, but also captures it in a specific area. Instead, what we tend to have is a government type of investment in infrastructure, which can often be called potholes over people. For example, that term was termed in 2018, when the UK government autumn budget statement provided more funding to repair potholes than for the entire education sector. What underpins the value created and captured from investment in infrastructure and is the first step in meaningful public engagement with infrastructure and particularly infrastructure change is social infrastructure. Stay with me. It's a long term for 7.33 on a Tuesday uh, evening. Social infrastructure is made of multiple dimensions which are mutually supportive. It includes buildings and facilities, but not just any buildings, not any facilities. We're talking about good quality places to live, open spaces, playgrounds, community halls, cafes. It also involves services and organizations. And it's important to distinguish that here we're talking both about privately funded and publicly funded services and organizations. Um, so funded through taxation, for example, and strong and healthy communities. So without the strong communities, that formal and informal connections with the place where we live, our surrounding environment and each other, we will not be able to make infrastructure work for us and deliver things out of an economic growth that we are interested in. So, I mean, not many people, when you ask them, what would you like from this type of infrastructure? They say, oh, I want economic growth. What we do tend to want is improved well-being, clean air, inclusive access to heat, and ability to benefit from the changes in infrastructure that are happening around us and are being underpinned by our money and by our service. So how do we do this? Alongside investment in built environment, we also need sustained investment in developing local formal and informal spaces for organization, self-organization, spaces where we can reflect on infrastructure how it does or does not work for us. And more importantly, spaces where we can critically engage in public discussion about the changes to infrastructure that are happening around us. So that means, how can local councils' plans for development and achieving net zero are going to open up such spaces mm -hmm. for discussion? And how we, as individuals, as a community, as families, and as consumers, going to infra, uh, engage with infrastructure change? How are we going to bridge the gaps between these social infrastructure spaces that help us to create and capture value and the type of investment that's coming from above? I leave the, the question to you and I'm here to start a discussion on it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Raleigh. It's so it's so evident how much you care about this and how much you're keen to kind of engage others in caring about infrastructure as well. So um, I'm, I think we might not have too much time for for comments on this, but um, Quiva, if you could read aloud some of the questions from the chat and then Raleigh, um, if you'd like to kind of engage with some of those potentially in the chat box as well, um, we can continue the conversation going there as well. So Quiva, over to you to read some of the questions and comments. Yes, um, Raleigh has sparked a lot of interest here, so there are many questions if she chooses to enter the chat. Um, we have a comment here from Nicole saying green infrastructure using nature based solutions like rain gardens for flood protection is often ignored but brings multiple benefits. Mark has an interesting question. My understanding of the vast quantity of train systems are they predominantly owned by French and German 
companies, the continuing rise in train ticket costs has meant I have to drive to work. Is there any movements in which to change this dynamic, keeping prices reasonable, with the profit being more directly invested into the UK's public transport system? We also have a lot of questions about um, council, local governance, and how people can play more of a role. And we have a, a great comment here from Ken Davis. Uh, many people will know that what I'm doing is a radical low energy refurb on a small dilapidated Victorian building on Bohemia Road. I've had in excess of 600 people visit the property during the work who've gone away with sound advice on making their buildings more energy efficient. My question is, how do the ordinary people of Hastings get the leaders of the town to understand what has to be done to existing buildings? We also have a comment from Andrew, a very good point here. There's an opportunity to translate the views from this evening into a submission to Hastings Borough Council for its current consultation on the draft local plan. And we'll share a link to that because that's definitely one way to um, have some ideas heard from tonight. And then finally, Ken asks, can we ask Raleigh what she thinks of less investment in roads and more in first and last mile transport, such as tiny electric cars to be hired from rail stations? Thank you so much, Quiba. So Raleigh, you were looking for engagements. Our audience is giving you some engagement. So do you wanna, do you wanna make one, one short comment, maybe like a breath long comment, and then we'll um, move to our next speaker? Um, sure, um, I would take the time to engage with everyone in the chat, but one of the key messages that I came with today and I seek engagement around is the idea that we shouldn't focus on investing in technology um, what we don't want is picking a right technology only. That's going to take us half the way. What we do want is we want not only to pick certain types of technologies that we want to run with, but we also want to create social movements and critical spaces for reflection around them so we can discuss whether they work for everyone equally, what kind of benefits they create. If we have these public spaces for uh, discussion and engagement, I think this is where a lot of the opportunity to change things is going to come. Currently, we have very little opportunity to discuss these things and very little desire to. I'm kind of grateful that Net Zero was introduced as a target because it gives us an opportunity to talk about these things. Uh, a lot more than before. Before we used to talk things when they didn't work and that's just <laughs> half of the fun. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And hopefully um, we can keep those conversations going and alive. Um, so we're going to keep uh, bringing more inspiration in uh, next with Julia Hilton. So Julia, can we come to you for your response to our big question of the evening? Hi, everyone. Adam, can I have my slide up so people can look at it while I'm talking? So um, I originally trained in economics. I wasn't very good at it because I could never get my head around the fact that it placed no value on anything without a monetary price, like clean air and water or any unpaid work such as rearing children or caring for our loved ones. Many people are focused on the concept of building back better after COVID-19, but we live in a world dominated and run according to this one particular economic story. Country's economic success, GDP or gross domestic product is measured by adding up all economic activity. Whether money is spent clearing up an oil spill or building a wind turbine, both sums are added to a total of all economic output and the bigger the number and the higher the growth increase, the better. What you choose to measure in society has a huge influence on what is valued and then pursued as policy. We know the current economic theory isn't working, but it still has huge power. And to replace it, we need a better story, a route to a world in which every person can lead their life with dignity, opportunity and community, and where we can all do so within the means of our life-giving planet. In other words, we need to get into the donut. And that's what's on the, slide, on the screen. What I love about Kate Raworth's concept of donut economics is that wherever your focus is on the circle of the donut, you can see how it connects to everything else. What if we were to mentally map our own lives on the donut, asking ourselves, how does the way that I shop, eat, travel, earn a living, bank, vote and volunteer affect my personal impact on social and planetary boundaries? Within current economics and statistics, where we sit as a town seems to be measured through failures, failure through our high levels of poverty, homelessness and ill health. 
While of course we need to recognize this, wouldn't it be better to be looking at our assets and using those to help people thrive? This needs to happen at the personal and the town-wide level. Every person has something to contribute. Are there more opportunities within the many types of invaluable helping work that goes on to recognize that those people being helped could have agency within their own lives and that they have skills to share to be part of the solution? The first Farm Palace in Hastings celebrated that, inviting local people to share their passions and skills with others, whether that be as simple as flower arranging or teaching ballroom dancing. Can I have the next slide, please? There have already been donut conversations starting in the town and you can move on through the next few, the next two, I think, um, mapping how existing community organizations sit within this circle. The task is to spread the conversations wider so that everyone can see how they can contribute to a Hastings donut vision. How are our big stakeholders viewing this future? Thank you. Team East Sussex, recovery as opportunity, at least starts using circular graphics. How much better if these missions were set within a donut concept so we can create a future that works for us and our planet? Next slide. Cornwall County Council and many cities across the world are using the donut as a frame for planning their future. This example maps the impact of a proposed new greenway. Next slide. Here, here, Hastings Council has just submitted their 28 million pound town deal investment plan. Let's make this plan donut based. Hastings as a garden town is part of that plan, creating beautiful planted biodiverse streets where we want to walk and cycle and interact. We intend to use the donut framework as a principle for everything we do, co-designing the vision, growing plants locally, using recycled materials and building a local skills base to look after these plantings. This is a picture of Sheffield Greater Green, by the way, Nigel Dunnett's on the panel. And finally, to quote Professor Sapatha Dasgupta, next slide please, in the economics of biodiversity. Oh no, sorry, I missed this one. Next one, <laughs> forgot about that one. The solution starts with understanding and accepting a simple truth. Our economies are embedded within nature not external to it. Thanks. Amazing, thank you so much, Julia. Um, Quiva, I'm gonna come straight to you to read out a couple of questions and then we might have a, a minute or so for Julia to respond. Great, thanks. Um, Julia, you have a lot of support um, for both incorporating the donut model into planning, um, but also for um, garden towns for planting, a lot of support here in the chat. Um, Amanda says, um, with community gardens, we could have health giving foods and plants growing our own together, um, being given this green space. And, um, sorry, <laughs> uh, we have quite a lot here. Um, Mary, who welcomes the donut, mentions Amsterdam now uses it as basis for its decisions. And Ursula mentions, it would be great to have a sustainable housing champion within the council or representing the community. Any announcement coming from the council always refers only to housing when they should be committed to sustainable, affordable housing. So echoing that holistic approach, which seems so important. And um, apologies, <laughs> trying to keep track. Right. No, that's um, perfect. Thank you. And yeah, and we just have more, um, an inspiring presentation. And thank you for reminding us of the donut. Brilliant. Um, Julia, do you want to take uh, maybe a minute or two to respond to anything that stood out to you from the questions and comments? Um, yeah, I think I just uh, would like to hear from people how they think um, we could perhaps start delivering this. I'm, I don't know how Cornwall's done it. They've bedded it into how they're thinking about everything. I think it, it's a really helpful framework for me it makes complete sense I wish I could have studied it when I was studying economics so I just wondered I don't want to throw the question back really I wonder what people think we could do um, to to make these conversations happen at uh, at the level you know their levels where the money comes the local enterprise partnerships the big local stakeholders the housing associations the con you know the hospital trusts they have money to spend if they were spending their money within this framework, what power that could have to change 
how we did stuff locally. Brilliant. Well, hopefully we'll get some some ideas and it sounds like conversations and imaginations and making these connections are all a core part of what people are hoping to do this evening. So um, continue to use the chat to engage with each other. It would be great um, if some kind of new relationships, new connections came out of this. So uh, Julia, please, please do feel free to continue putting in there. I see that there are more questions coming in by the minute. So I'm sure that there's some more for you to engage with if you'd like. Um, but without further ado, we'd like to go over to our next panelist, uh, Hannah um, from Wonderful. So Hannah, over to you. Hello. Um, okay, so before I start talking about um, refill shopping, I want to um, share a bit of my shame of my past life in marketing, um, because I hope it highlights just how broken and absurd the current sort of status quo um, it really is. Um, and it's a system that we've just sort of accepted as, as being completely normal. Um, unfortunately, my specialism in marketing was, um, it tends to only be funded by organisations like, uh, organisations corporations like um, P&G, Unilever, L'Oreal, um, you know, all of the all of the good guys, massive multinational corporations um, in the FMCG sector. So FMCG, fast moving consumer goods, moving in one direction, produced at one end, uh, thrown away at the other, um, with money wicking the other way from all of these markets that, um, that these huge organizations operate in. And they're pretty much everywhere now wicking all of the money back into a central pot, um, usually housed in um, some profitable, uh, favourable tax um, environment. Um, they make products like this. Uh, I'm just going to use Flash as an example, nothing specifically tar targeted against these people. Um, again, just to sort of highlight some of that absurdity of what we, what we just accept as normal. Flash used to come in a box as a powder, cardboard box, um, but they worked out that it was much more profitable. It looked like better value to start selling it like this. 90% of this is, is water, and I'm probably being really generous there. Um, so you're paying for all of this water and all of this packaging to be shipped from, this is made in Weybridge, but it's made in Weybridge wherever you are in, in the UK. And we have water and we have bottles everywhere else. Um, you're also paying for this plastic spray top very useful, um, probably not going to be recycled when you finished using it. Um, and it's probably going to, it won't last forever, but it would outlive the contents of this bottle. Uh, ironically, also perversely, the contents of the bottle is actually the bit that they make as cheaply as possible without being sort of noticeably dangerous. Um, so you're paying for this to be shipped all around, all around the country when you don't really, really need to. Um, you're you're also paying for this label and all of the research that goes behind it and this huge army of marketers who are extremely expensive and and I know firsthand um, they're often incredibly wasteful um, whether it's flights they don't need to be on or money they don't need to be spent money they don't need to spend or research that, that goes absolutely nowhere and, and, and serves nobody um, um and and I can, I can share like, well, I'll, I'll skip over all of some of these uh, mind boggling stories that I've got about waste that, that goes into this process because it could go on for a while. Very little of what you're paying for when you buy something like this actually makes your bathroom any cleaner. And you're also paying by your council tax for the disposal, for hopefully the recycling, but um, you know, we know that's probably not, not the case. Um, so everyone knows that this situation is, is completely massively wasteful. Um, but I think most people just think it's too difficult to change it. And there are so many salaries that are dependent on this. There are entire industries that are, in, that are dependent on this completely wasteful, wonky situation. Um, and actually, waste is built into the profit margins of some of these organisations. So I've got some props here. Um, let's say a company makes electric toothbrushes and they also make um, manual toothbrushes, old school ones and they also make toothpaste. Now there's various reasons why they want to shift people um, into using electric toothbrushes, but they know that with brushes like this, consumers waste more toothpaste because they cover the whole surface area rather than just putting a little blob on there. They're using way more products than they actually need to use, but that means they'll be back in the supermarkets sooner, they'll be buying the, tooth the toothpaste again, so it makes sense for them to carry on like that. And that's exactly the same situation when you look at um, detergent companies who are unlikely to switch entirely to single dose 
capsules or tablets that you throw into the washing machine and, and just get on with it. Because they don't want to stop people wasting the product. They, most people use a little bit too much detergent or fabric softener or whatever, then they actually need to get their clothes clean. Um, and they don't want to stop that because for these guys, it's like, it's not just greed is good, but waste is good. And they make money off it. Um, I won't go into the whole food waste issue, um, but suffice to say that supermarkets are making money they're profiting whether we eat what we buy from them or whether it goes in the bin. And it, we're dealing with you know, tens of millions of tonnes of, of food waste every year when we've also got um, food, the, ne the need for food banks and shareholders who probably don't care what we do with, with what, we've, what we've bought and we probably like it if it all went in the bin and, uh, and we came back the next day. So small independent refill shops um, are just one alternative to these systems because they are purposefully designed to reduce waste. Um, and it's a far from perfect model, but it's you know, relatively new, it's still growing, it's becoming more efficient and it's improving um, you know, by, the, by the week really. So I'm sure everyone's really familiar with how it works, but we buy products in bulk, customers reuse their own containers. They can buy products in absolutely tiny proportions, just whatever they need, so we sell spices by the teaspoon if that's what if that's what people really want and that's totally fine um and because we're based uh well we're based in king's road uh central st leonard's the idea is that that last mile the mile that takes um that takes people from the retailer to their home address is done or it can be done on foot or um or on a bike um we'll never be able to and i'm going to say you know we i mean i'm talking about all refill shops, all small independent refill shops um, with a similar model to ours, but we'll never be able to compete with, with supermarkets um, in terms of price. But we can do our best to eliminate waste, and that's waste packaging, waste food, and waste finances, because we're sort of laser focused on the communities that we're, we're actually trying to serve. Um, we, we don't need to do a market research because we actually, we operate, we exist in, in these communities. We can get direct feedback from customers and direct requests for, um, for products that we can, we can try to source within, within hopefully within weeks. Um, also our interests are the same as our customers because we live in the communities that, that we're serving. Um, and one day when we do actually turn a profit, that money will stay in the, in, in the, in the community because you know, that's where we live. Um, I'm pretty sure that this applies to all sorts of businesses. So if, if there's anything good coming out of this pandemic, pandemic is that people are starting to um, review their careers. Um, I'm sure that there are so many sustainably minded startups that that could be um, that could be supported in, in our town to employ local people to keep the keep the profit hub um, within our town. Um, I've got a few ideas on how we could make that easier for startups, but I'm conscious of time. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you want to open up to, to questions. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, and thank you for always being extremely patient with me when I come in for my one teaspoon of things. I really, <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things that you haven't mentioned in here is the infinite energy and patience for running around and filling all those out. So m mad props to you for kind of your dedication to this as well. Um, Quiva, we have probably more questions than we have time for responses to. So would you mind just giving them some space and voice? And then we'll come back to Hannah for maybe a quick response before we move on to the next panelist. Absolutely. Uh, there's a great debate developing in the chat here. Um, Mary says, corporations are the root of our economic problems. And Graham comments, I feel the way forward is to not be over-reliant on engaging with council, large corporations, and start concentrating on every single person in the area, power of the community. Julia says, yes, this is good, but it is still councils and the LEP that access the big chunks of money and waste a lot of it. We need much more leverage on how this money gets spent. And then um, we have a comment uh, from Felicity, question, Hannah, as a former marketing insider, how do we make these corporations sit up and listen to ideas of change? Oh, um, I could quickly answer that one um, if there's time. So yeah, yeah. I'm I'm really realistic about what actual impacts little shops like this can do. Um, and even when we were starting out and I was all, you know, excited about it, um, <laughs> I still am. Uh, I knew that the actual impact, and it's, I don't want to take away from the efforts that our customers 
um, make because I know it's a massive, it's a massive chore shopping in a refill shop. Sorry, it just, it can be. Um, hopefully it's pleasant. But, um, but, you know, what really can we do? What, what impact is this happening on the, you know, drop in the literal ocean? What it is doing, and I know this from experience, is we've reached a tipping point where we're shaming um, the FMCG giants and we're shaming the supermarkets into actually doing it themselves. And really, it's only at that point that I think we'll make drastic changes to how much plastic is, is getting wasted. So... As long as we can keep going, as long as we can show that, um, you know, show that this works and that people are interested in it, the big guys have to take notice and they have to start um, sorting their act out. Thank you so much, Hannah, for your, your clear sightedness of a strategy through to influence and change and to help people through imagination and sometimes through shame um, to change. <laughs> so really, really appreciate that and invite you to kind of join into the chat if you'd like to make comments on any of the other Absolutely. things that people raise. Um, but without further ado, we'd like to come on to our next panelist. Uh, Anna, over to you for your response to the big question. Hi, can everyone see me? Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. So um, I am a permaculture gardener and obviously when you do gardening like that, it's always organic and it's always thinking about ecosystems. But obviously when you grow food, the whole point is that we're feeding ourselves, but I'm also interested in the local food network. So if I could have the first slide. Um, and it doesn't seem long ago actually that we had that wonderful food network meeting with Patrick Holden in um, the Beacon probably about three years now. This is a more developed version of what um, I showed then and it's basically this ecosystem approach of how we provide for our food needs within a town. Um, and um, there's this brilliant thing that I've recently become really into called cosmopolitan localism. Um, and it does come out of the transition town uh, movements um, and discussions of that in America. And it's that kind of dynamic of like being able to meet our local needs such as food um, in this example, but also maintain this kind of global awareness um, and I think that's really important. And it's kind of like, you know, it's this thing that we can aspire to. to and I think the pandemic's really kind of probably going to fuel us in this direction, um, along with world trade and climate change, that we will have to kind of meet our needs more locally, um, but with this kind of mindfulness. Um, so, yeah, we need to, you know, in economics as well, self-supporting closed loop systems that reinforce each other and support each other is something um, that, you know, as a town, you know, we can try and do this. Um, and indeed, you know, we do have elements of this happening in the town. I would like to make a shout out for a local food hub shop if anyone wants to set one up. Because like I grow food to make food um, and I think there's great scope to setting up local food businesses, but we need a place to sell it. Um, so yeah, can I move on to the next slide, please? So this, um, we did another talk actually in Home Ground Kitchen. And um, when I was introducing that, I kind of tried to um, kind of praise what it was, what sustainable food was. And I came up with these six um, questions. The first two we're very familiar with um, and obviously, you know, the chemical impact in terms of health and our environment on our food. But I think Julia would be pleased with the uh, fourth one. So where did my pound go? And I think it's really um, good to think about, you know, the artisan producers and the local shops and um, go to Hannah at Wonderful. Um, and uh, on that note, the, the fifth one um, and the sixth one, what is it wrapped in, is really key in terms of waste. So I know everyone's really familiar with all these things, but um, you know, as a town, let's, particularly with food and buying food choices, think about these questions. That was all I was gonna say. So any questions? That was amazing. That was actually exactly three minutes. <laughs> Thank <laughs> no, you. We'll have, hey, we'll have hey. some time to kind of engage with some of the questions. Um, Quiva, can we get some of those? 
please. Absolutely. Um, first, a compliment to Anna. Um, Rod Webb mentions that, um, like your first slide, these simple diagrams are really excellent ways for us all to get to grips with this stuff. Um, and then um, there are some suggestions. So local growers, farmers, market might be possible after lockdown. Um, Alice talks about um, workers being paid fairly. I don't know if you have something to say to that, Anna. Um, and oops. <laughs> um, yeah, apologies. Um, question, how can this be made available to people of modest means? Okay, so firstly, the answer to Rod is that was Ursula McLaughlin um, interpreting um, a diagram for me and it does really help, doesn't it, to see that kind of whole picture. Um, in terms of fair prices, um, you know, it's a big discussion, but um, local food, I think the more that we can produce as a town, community gardens, making food products here, um, and keeping our kind of money in 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 the town, you know, it's called like um, not falling through the sieve. So making sure we spend our pound and it stays in our local economy. It's kind of like I know organic food is really expensive, but um, you know we have to push through that kind of barrier where where um, we're making the choice to buy the organic food to support the local farmers to support um, organic growing methods that don't rely on fossil fuels. Um, but in short, you know, you can, you can go and buy things in bulk, but going to our two wonderful refill shops in Hastings, buying organic food in bulk and also growing our own, buying from our local veg boxes and things like that. So it, it, it is affordable and it will become more affordable. I think we have to believe that. I have one more question if we have time, Claire, for Anna. Uh, an interesting one from Mary. Human shelter is part of permaculture. How can it become part of housing policy? Human shelter and housing policy. I think, well, the thing with permaculture, it's looking at the whole, it's looking, it's looking for solutions. So obviously, um, you know, shelter that um, is not um, wasting energy, shelter that is well built and it's kind of, you know, low carbon emissions, low impact shelter, hopefully is the future. Um, but yeah, I mean, it should, you know, we've got all these schemes in town, but how often do we actually see it? I mean, I've got a thing which is like, let's hold the council accountable to make sure that all of this housing that they say they're going to build is actually going to manifest and, and that they spend all the money on the housing and, and not kind of on the outside of the housing, if you know what I mean. I don't know if that helps. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, so I think that there, there are continuing conversations happening in the chat, um, Anna. So if you'd like to okay. continue engaging in them in there, that'd be wonderful. Um, we now have reached kind of the full range of panelists' views on the big question. And I just want to bring in Raquel for a moment uh, to, to view her live capture illustration. Raquel, well, um, are you prepared to share with us a little bit yeah, of what you've got? Yeah, now with you all. And I'm going to put it bigger. Oh, wow. Amazing. Still lots of things coming. Yeah. I don't know if you can see it. You can see it big, big enough. I'll put it bigger, I think. Let me do it again. That's it. Great. Can, can you see it now properly? Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Well, I have uh, I have lots of notes uh, yet, so it's going to be more more detailed after. But as you can see, I have uh, captured a bit of everything just trying to focus on the very key uh, points and uh, the ideas that are a bit the core of all the conversations so in the end everything i think should be connected which is the point that's amazing i see little bits and pieces oh you've been captured izzy i love the guitar up there that's beautiful yeah, You're getting some you have to be there and then um so in the end, everything is going to be kind of connected because once you are listening to the conversations, you can see that there is a common ground everywhere. And so the beauty of that is like, it's going to be a landscape, but everything kind of connected. So hopefully we'll see in the end. 
That's brilliant. And how do you how do you find it listening and interpreting that at the same time? You guys are doing a very I'm impressed with uh, how this event is going because I've been covering many of them and this is very inspiring like the talks the speeches are like really inspiring uh, with all the images and uh, the rhythm is very dynamic so it's a pleasure it's just um, I didn't realize that I, I have done this all and in a second I was absolutely involved in this so I'm, I'm really enjoying it guys well done very very well done. Oh that's amazing and it's it's really lovely to see Kind of the, the emerging conversation depicted back just like as a reflection so yeah you. then once once i send you the art the digital file you, you may see because there are lots of details that you might need to see more like with more time but that's that's the that's more or less what's gonna how it's gonna look oh brilliant thank you so much raquel and thank there's a some, some wonderful comments to, to encourage and support you with uh, from the audience in the chat. So if you wanted to check that out as well, that's there as well. Thank you, guys. Um, brilliant. Thanks, Raquel. So at this point, we're going to bring it back to you, our audience. Um, we want to know what your response to the big question of this evening is. What is it that we can do to make Hastings a thriving place that supports a flourishing planet. So Quiva, um, we'd love to get some more um, kind of audience comments on the big question. So please do start putting your ideas in the chat if you haven't already done so. We know that you've been doing this throughout the evening, um, but we, we really want to kind of open this up to you. So Quiva, can you tell us a little bit about what's happening in the chat? Yeah, there's been a real theme tonight, I think, which is um, people power. So holding holding people to account, making sure that all of us have our voices heard in um, planning, but also doing things ourselves. And I've seen some beautiful ideas in here. Um, in response to um, Anna, Linda has said, what about a pop up stall when possible? With Leaflet incorporating Anna's questions, the idea of reusing um, from Wonderful organic food, the link highlighting the link to Transition Town, and we have in Hastings so many resources like Hastings Green Directory. So these ideas of, of sharing in person instead of just online when we can. Um, those are really good. Ken Davis mentions planted roofs. I love that idea. Um, we also have um, a lot of support for a universal basic income to make all of these things possible, which is really interesting. Um, we also have from Adam, um, looks great, but I've been involved in local environment cam environmental campaigning over the years and I've taken time out for a while as I got disappointed in so much chat but very little happening. How can we ensure that all this discussion amounts to something that can realistically be achieved? And that's a really good question. We'll be sharing resources after this event, um, but we hope that all of you will take some inspiration from this. Most of you are already working hard on your own projects, but we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to share them and connect you up if we can. Casey says, community composting, excellent, practical, doable. Um, and we also have Amanda saying, we're doing small scale composting in Speckled Wood Community Garden next to Ore Village Green. So if you're interested, check that. Um, and yes, a local plan Zoom, an excellent idea. So this is um, an organized contribution um, to submit to the local plan consultation. I think that's amazing. And Julia has asked, can we email all participants if we manage to get a local plan Zoom up and running? Yes, is the answer. We would love to help. And um, question from Laura, how do we keep the council accountable, i.e. pressure them to make better new housing decisions. Rod says, I think we're all resistant to losing um, the comforts and convenience of so-called modern living. That's a really good point. We have to be willing to make the shift and find something that is genuinely in it for us all. Saving the planet, unfortunately, isn't enough. <laughs> um, so yeah, we all need to we all need to think about that and what we are willing to sacrifice. Nicole says the Garden Town team hope to seed wildflowers across the town for a flower festival this summer. We all need some hope and positive change. And that sounds wonderful as spring is coming in. It gives us all hope. So that's a selection of what's going on. There's so much more, uh, but back over to you, Claire. 
thank you so much, Quiva. So um, I just want to kind of invite all of our panelists, if you'd like, uh, to, to put your cameras on and we'll come back around to you to kind of engage a little bit in some of these questions, if there's any additional things that you didn't get uh, to discuss when it was your time to answer questions. So uh, if, you'd like to, if you'd like to engage anything, if you just want to raise your hand and we can come straight over to you to respond to any of the ideas that have come forward or any of the questions that have emerged. Um, so I see that we've got a couple of folks uh, on camera. Um, anyone like to pick up any questions? or comment on the other presentations as well, since that's the first time that you heard each other speak, any connections that you want to weave across the presentations that you've made. Yeah, Raleigh, thank you. Thanks, I just wanted to say that uh, I really loved the idea of uh, urban gardens and green spaces. And uh, if you ever wondered why the image I picked for tonight was a jar of pickles, <laughs> and a room full of jar of pickles um, it's because I didn't have time to make this point but uh, this was the result of a project which looked at how different types of infrastructure are linked to each other so those jars of pickles were coping practices of severely uh, fuel poor people in several different sites and what we discovered is that because of systemic issues with energy supply in certain places, the way for which people cope with being able to uh, have heat comfort and to pay for energy bills was through urban gardening. And the way they pickled food and preserved it for the winter, it was done in such a way that allowed them to actually control how much energy they were using throughout the whole year. So um, that's why I think we should uh, really try to have uh, a lot of connected discussions because uh, no, to rephrase Ernest Hemingway, no infrastructure is an island and it, the ways in which you actually things are linked in our lives and the ways in which they're hidden and they kind of become visible when we are struggling with something, whether it's going to be a global pandemic or whether it's going to be uh, an ability to uh, pay for the type of things that we want. That's when things become visible. And that's an opportunity for us to have a connected discussion about them. So this is what I really like. And I'm really yeah. glad that Raquel is kind of drawing a connected landscape because it puts a lot of issues that are important to many of us on the same page. Thank you so much, Raleigh. Um, I'm gonna come over to Anna and then I think Quiva might've had something as well. I think that's really interesting about the pickles because um, you know, this is a really low impact way of preserving food. You don't need a freezer, a fridge. If you think about it, our ancestors had all the answers or were living in lower impact ways. It's just that we found all these fossil fuels and, you know, we could be super generous with it. But now, you know, sauerkraut, wonderful thing um, that doesn't need refrigeration. And um, it's really interesting. Even wines don't particularly need much energy to make. So I think food's a really nice way to engage with people and also to start living that lower impact life. Even I think in terms of when you eat something that you've grown, you hardly need to eat any of that food because it's really nourishing for you. And um, it's just this whole kind of um, societal kind of need of more and more and and you know it's just it's just um, it's just fantasy we don't we don't need as much as we have we can definitely live in a low impact way um, and I, I think that's that connects a little bit with uh, what we heard from Gonzalo earlier as well that we, we have these heritages, we have this knowledge, we know these things. And, and there have been ways which, you know, Hannah was kind of describing as well in which we've been encouraged to, or disincentivized in remembering these things. So I think a lot of this is really coming back to and relearning and reappreciating, engaging with some of those practices, aren't they? Um, yeah, Gonzalo. 
Um, no, I, I fully, uh, definitely um, I agree with Anna in terms of a low impact um, lifestyle and all sort of things. And I would like to see that someone mentioned in the chat about um, a positive vision uh, for the future of Hastings. And I think that's very much, very much needed because at the end of the day, yes, we're going through very critical times, but I think we also need a positive view. We need to make the positive case. Uh, I, I, uh, uh, some time ago, I, I heard I had a, one of the talks, I can't remember, and I've been putting that in practice in my own garden, you know, inviting wildlife, organic, and it's been wonderful. The, the, my garden has been my salvation through this time of, of lockdown, for example. So I think we need that positive vision and, and, and engage people with nature um, and, and, and reconnect with, in my view, with, with our wonderful ocean that we've got there. People, you know, I've, be, I've seen it myself. And it's so refreshing. I think we do need to recover that positive vision for for everyone's sake and for nature's sake as well. Thank you so much, Gonzalo. And, and Hannah, I'm just seeing you kind of really absorbing and like nodding and into this. So I just want to come and see if you wanted to comment on any of it because you seem so kind of aligned with what people have been saying. Do you want to jump in no. here? I totally am, and I, you know, I didn't have anything to add. Really, I forgot my camera was on. But no, I'm just so um, I'm so sort of uh, encouraged by all the conversations that are having, and um, you know, I know a lot of time goes into these things, but I think it's so important that we that we all like make that time to actually get together and talk about things because we bounce so many ideas off each other, and you know, some, it's it's all bloody hard, and we're all so flipping busy, but. Um, it, you you do feed off the energy from from other people and it and it gets you re-engaged in in um in you know making the town as as amazing as it can be for everybody. So yeah, no, nothing specific to add. But the energy and the enthusiasm is always welcome to keep the conversation <laughs> going. Um, and I know that that was something that Julia that you were quite interested in is how to grow this conversation, keep it going, and bringing people together. So. Um, I'll come to Quiva because I, I skipped line a little bit before coming back to you, but did you have some more to add? Yeah, I'd just like to feed through one more great question from the chat. Um, Sherry asks, in terms of thriving, what gets counted count. Do panelists have any examples of new indicators that are being used and by whom? So as an alternative to maybe traditional indicators that don't take into account uh, people and thriving such as GDP. Thank you so much, Quiva. Um, I'll, I'll kind of pass it over to any panelists who would like to pick that up. Are there any any um, indicators that you're aware of that you want to share with us? Gonzalo, yeah. I think uh, the um, Julia mentioned about the, um, the new uh, economics um, biodiversity um, report and a good way of of finding out those new indicators, which definitely we definitely need them, it's to reasserting the nature as nature such as as an asset, which that report actually um, it's quite strong about that. And within that asset, the biodiversity within nature it's what makes it sustainable. And I think we need to we need to reconnect, making again taking uh, you know that concept that Anna was mentioning. I think we need to think very carefully about the principle that actually there is a nature as such is an asset and that will take us to new indicators for the future. Thank you so much, Gonzalo. Um, so we're, we're closely reaching um, the kind of end of the evening. So thank you so much for keeping the conversation moving in the chat. Thank you to our panelists for all of your incredible contributions and your incredible comments. Um, and we just like to showcase to local folks, who, there were a couple of questions in there around staying motivated, uh, the energy from conversations, but how do we put those into action? And so we wanted to, to spotlight um, to folks who are already taking steps to make Hastings a more sustainable and thriving place. So first we'll have Shelley Feldman, who will be speaking on the Library of Things, and then Sarah Macbeth, who will talk a little bit more about the Green Directory. So Shelley, over to you. Hi, thank you. Um, 
Yeah, so Hastings Library of Things, um, it's a new project um, and it's a community project with strong eco credentials, I guess. The idea is that you can uh, borrow things, use them, give them back and they're cleaned and then they get used again. So that's all sorts of things, drills, tents, pasta machines, loads of stuff. Um, it's starting this spring in Claremont and it's very much a member led organisation. So we want you to join. Um, the, um, there's going to be some contact details, I think, in the resource sheet that's coming out. But, you know, I'm, I'm just I'm just going to put them in the chat as well. And um, yeah, um, just look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shelley. And yes, we've just uh, had those put into the chat by Quiva. Um, so now over to Sarah Macbeth uh, to speak about the Green Directory. Hello. Um, yeah, so my, um, this sort of ties in nicely with some of the things that came up around public spaces for engagement um, and social infrastructure. Um, so in 2018 and 2019, um, a team of us put together a Sustainability on Sea Festival, which we obviously have to put on hold for now. Um, but in 2019, we had over 60 events with people running um, all sorts of different activities around sustainable practices. Uh, and that was like over a hundred organizations and local businesses. Um, so we took a lot of the data from though, that particular year and developed um, the Green Directory, which is currently on the Transition Town website. And I can paste the link in if, and then the chat. Um, uh, yeah, it, it needs some work. It's it's a work in progress. It's probably even got some things in there that probably don't exist anymore. Um, but um, what we'd like to do and what we're going to do over the next year or so is trying to develop it into more of a kind of community climate active network. Um, and we do have a bit of money from Cult Foundation to look into that um, and tie in with the idea of a physical space, some kind of eco hub or eco center. Um, uh, so yeah, so in the next year, we, we want to develop this network idea and the idea of having physical space and running various events and conversations. So yeah, um, if you're interested, do get in touch. I will put an email address in the chat as well. That's it. Amazing. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, so yeah, thanks both to Shelley and Sarah for sharing those really inspirational projects. Um, and I believe Raleigh also has a competition promotion to share with us, uh, if you'd like to say something quickly about that. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to announce that uh, in partnership with all the wonderful people tonight and the Hastings Independent, uh, we are now officially launching a competition um, for Net Zero Hastings. Um, we are inviting people to um, write to us and submit responses to uh, one or all or four questions. What does net zero mean for me? How are we going to afford becoming net zero? How would you like net zero in Hastings to be achieved? And how do we make sure that the transition to net zero benefits everyone and doesn't leave anyone behind? We have some uh, wonderful prizes and most of all, this creates an opportunity to have a, a broader discussion uh, with people and images about how do we imagine this will happen. Submissions will have to be by in by the 19th of March. And the best thing is at the end of it, um, in cooperation with all the wonderful local partners on this call and Hastings Independent, we will publish a special issue on Net Zero and Hastings which will aim to showcase all the work that's happened until now and the vision that there is, a bottom-up vision of what this transition would look like for Hastings. Um, I will put the link in the chat. Amazing, thank you so much, Raleigh. Um, and just to say, if you have any ideas that you would like to share beyond this event, the Hastings Emerging Futures team really would like to invite you to add your ideas to our online map of ideas, which can be found on the Common Treasury website. So um, to find, to add your ideas to the map and find links to all of the other projects which we have showcased today, uh, we invite you to visit the commontreasury.org.uk 
forward slash sustainable Hastings. Um, and that will also be added into the chat momentarily. So um, what an amazing evening we've had. To close, we just want to come back to Raquel um, to see what Raquel has managed to capture from tonight's conversations and an invitation to all of you to, to kind of add a comment into the chat maybe about something that you'll also be remembering or taking away from this evening as we look at uh, Raquel's live drawing. So Raquel, can we come over to you, please? Yes, I'm gonna share the screen with you again for the final. Mm -hmm. The final one, let me check if this is not the one. So I'll just check what's going on here. That's it. Can you see this one now? No, you are not seeing this one. Not yet, nope, but that's we'll it. there. Here we are. Yeah, thank you. Ah, oh, this is looking beautiful. Oh, wow. I think there is a bit of every uh, talk and every uh, panel and also some ideas uh, of the discussions and uh, probably I'll add a few more details that are, I have in the notes, but it's uh, basically that's it. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Is, is, are there any, any little details in here that kind of uh, make you smile as as our artist capture for the evening. I was really, I, I really enjoy doing the, the um, because it's about nature, it's about people, um, the ideas, these, um, I always like animals, so the farm and local food is very funny to draw. Also the people like um, gardening, uh, growing their own food, um, it's very, it's, it's, it's like um, the oceans, uh, even the jar of pickles was very, <laughs> very inspiring. So I think it's, it's a very nice uh, subject to draw, to be honest, for me, it's a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. But it's always a pleasure working with Raleigh. It's always a pleasure, Raleigh, I have to say that. So it's just another panel for me, but it was very inspiring. And I have to say again, thank you, because it was really amazing coordinating and organized everything. So thank you for having me. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure having you and we look forward to kind of seeing that the full picture emerge. So um, yeah, what an amazing evening we have had folks. And, and just to say, um, there, there are also uh, resources on the Common, Common Treasury websites, just in case you're watching this video afterwards. And those are at commontreasury.org.uk forward slash resources. So just in case you're looking for any of those. Um, so it just leaves me really to say, a huge thank you to all of our panelists um, for their presentations on the big questions. So uh, Gonzalo, um, to, to Raleigh, to Julia, to Hannah, to Anna, thank you so much for all of your contributions. Thank you to Izzy Withers for her amazing performance of John Lennon's Imagine, which really kind of touched the spirit and, and set the tone for the evening. Thanks to everyone on the Hastings Emerging Futures and Isolation Station teams behind the scene. Um, but most especially, thank you to all of you who joined us online tonight and we look forward uh, to taking a conversation with forward with you next. So thank you so much and hope you have a good night. Thanks everyone. <laughs>